This presentation is on initial work towards a formal theory of DeFi. My name is James Chang. I am a PhD at the Technical University of Denmark. And this is joint work with my co-advisors, Massimo Bartoletti from the University of Cagliari and Alberto Luz La Fuente from the Technical University of Denmark. We kindly refer to the following two publications for further details. That is, The Systemization of Knowledge, Lending Pools in Decentralized Finance, to be published in the Workshop for Trusted Smart Contracts, and A Theory of Automatic Market Makers in DeFi. So DeFi or Decentralized Finance is transforming finance into something new. Crypto asset markets are now being disintermediated. Smart contracts perform algorithmic price discovery on both swap rates and also loan interest rates. This allows for complex composition of DeFi contracts which are emerging, which we would like to understand more formally. However, this also introduces new challenges for formal analysis. DeFi contracts are complex, and even though formal verification on their implementations are useful for finding bugs, it is difficult to reason about more higher level behavior at the implementation level. For example, DeFi safety relies on the incentive alignment of all agents. Thus, we believe this forms optimal conditions for formal methods research. Our contributions thus far focus on a formal label transition system model of composable DeFi archetypes. Now, this includes lending pools and automatic market makers, as we will show in this presentation. Our models are parameterized by interest and swap rate functions, meaning that the implementation-specific economic models are abstracted away, and we focus on key properties instead. This focus on key economic properties allows us to formalize higher-level security properties and foundational behavior of DeFi. Now, our research goal is to develop a DeFi algebra which allows us to formally explain the interaction and composition of different DeFi primitives and to describe the DeFi ecosystem more formally. In modeling DeFi as a label transition system, we express states as configurations, shown here with gamma i. A configuration consists of subterms such as user wallets. Here we have user A with 100 units of tau 0 and user B with 100 units of tau 1. Lending pool contracts consist of discrete fund pools, each holding units of a specific token type. Here we have 50 units of tau 0 and 50 units of tau 1. AMN contracts consist of token pairs. Each pair consists of two distinct token types. Here we have tau 0 and tau 1. A configuration can also capture other stateful contracts, such as token prices. Here denoted P. This can be thought of as a global asset price or implemented as a price oracle on the blockchain. A transition from one configuration to the other, or from one state to the other, occurs via an action label. This is performed by a user. Here we show an overview of all the transitions uh, that we have specified for lending pools and automatic market makers. This specification, uh, these specifications capture the main economic utility that is offered to the user by these DeFi archetypes. This formal specification also lends itself towards proving um, foundational behavior of such DeFi contracts via mechanized proofs, be that through model checking or through automated theorem proving. We focus on lending and swaps because we believe these two uh, semantics allow us to describe a big part of the DeFi phenomenon. This includes margin trading, liquidations, and attacks. In our presentation, we begin by providing an introduction to our lending pool semantics. Lending pools are disintermediated loan markets. We now show an example trace of an execution between two agents, A and B, and a lending pool. Both introduced the concept of the lending pool, but also to show the semantics of our uh, lending pool formal model. A and B are mutually unknown and untrusted. Agent A holds 125 units of tau 0 and would like to earn interest on it. Agent B holds 100 units of tau 1 and would like to borrow the units of tau 0. In order for borrowing to be possible, A initially deposits 100 units of tau 0 to the lending pool. This results in transition from, tau, from gamma 0 to gamma 1, shown below. As you can see in the wallet of agent A, 
it has transferred 100 units of Tau Zero to the lending pool, and in return received 100 units of minted tokens uh, associated with Tau Zero shown in curly brackets. These mint tokens represented the deposit that A has made and allows A to later redeem these minted tokens for the underlying asset held in the lending pool. From Gamma 0 to Gamma 1, we can see that a new lending pool fund has been created, holding 100 units of Tau 0, deposited by Agent A. Now that there are funds in the lending pool, Agent B, B may be tempted to attempt to borrow. However, this is not valid. This is not a valid action. Because if B were able to borrow 50 units of Tau 0, there would be nothing that incentivizes B to ever repay that debt. Instead, B must first deposit 100 units of Tau 1 itself. We can see in, in Gamma 2 that following the, the deposit of B, a new fund has been created in the lending pool holding 100 units of Tau 1, and B now holds 100 units of minted tokens associated with Tau 1, showing that it is now a depositor as well. Now, subsequently, B is now in a position to borrow. B fires the, the transition borrow. 50 units of tau zero. We can see in gamma three that the 50 units have been transferred from the LP fund of tau zero to agent B. B's wallet now indicates that it holds 50 units of tau zero, but that it also owes 50 units to the lending pool. The 100 units of minted tau one represent collateral. They are not freely transferable. We can think of collateralization in lending pools as follows. On the left-hand side, you see a graph or a ratio of value of minted tokens held by an agent over the value of borrowed tokens held by the same agent. For B, the ratio is marked as the purple dot. This dot currently lies above C min, the minimum collateralization threshold. The collateralization for B in gamma on the right-hand side can be computed as the value of minted tokens held by B over the value of borrowed tokens uh, held by B. In our simple example, it is the uh, amount of collateral held by B are the 100 tokens, 100 minted tokens associated with Tau1. And we assume the price to be 1, and we also assume the exchange rate of the minted tokens to be 1. In the denominator, we see the value of the loan uh, that B currently holds, that is the 50 units of tau zero, and here we also assume a price of one. Interestingly enough, following B's borrow action, A is also in a position to borrow. A currently fires the borrow action for 25 units of tau one, and we can see that A's wallet now also includes funds of tau one, as well as a loan amount of 25. We note, both A and B now play the role of lender and borrower. A is a lender of Tau0 and a borrower of Tau1, and B is a lender of Tau1 and a borrower of Tau0. As time passes, we can model the accrual of interest in the lending pool with the int transition. We can see here after the firing of int from gamma4 to gamma5, both wallets of A and B have now experienced an increase in their borrow amounts of Tau1 and Tau0, respectively. The minted tokens held by both agents increase in value as int is fired. This is because the amount of units of, underlying, uh, of the underlying token that they can be redeemed for increases. This is called the exchange rate. We, can we see here that the exchange rate for A's 100 units of uh, minted tau zero uh, uh, is now 1.1, and B's exchange rate for the 100 units of tau minted tau one is now 1.05. We will revisit the exchange rate later. Subsequently, the interest accrual transition is fired again. Now, again, the uh, loan amounts of both A and B must increase. However, the collateralization of B may no longer be sufficient 
since B has a higher loan amount than A. In fact, B has now become under collateralized. On the left chart, we can see the value, the ratio of um, B's minted, the ratio of the value of B's minted tokens versus the value of B's loans. The interest accrual has resulted in a shift of this ratio for B from the gray point to the purple one, which now lies below the minimal uh, collateralization threshold C min. As such, B is now uh, uh, prone to liquidation. Liquidation means that a, any agent is able to repay the loans of B and in return allows this, this uh, liquidating agent is allowed to seize any minted tokens held by B. In our example, this is performed on the right-hand side. We see that agent A performs the liquidation and A repays 25 units of tau zero um, of B's loans. And in return, A can seize 30 units of minted tau one. And these are seized from the wallet of B. The vector that we see is represents the shift of the ratio of B of uh, minted tokens to loan, uh, which occurs during this transaction of liquidation. And the slope of this vector, you can see, represents the discount ratio that incentivizes A to perform this action. A can only liquidate B until B's ratio uh, reaches C min again, as shown here on the right-hand side. So as we can see, A performs a liquidation, repays 25 units of tau zero of B's loan, and in return can seize 30 units of minted tau one. And we now see that in gamma seven, agent A holds 30 units of minted tau one. Following the liquidation, um, A may be uh, interested in redeeming these 30 minted tokens of tau one for the underlying asset, tau one. And this is what A does. We know that the exchange rate can be computed as follows. The exchange rate is the total amount of user loans of a given token type, plus the total amount of, uh, of funds in the lending pool of that token type, over the total supply of the minted token associated with that token type uh, of the lending pool. And in this case, uh, the ratio is 1.1. We have now shown a simple uh, example or execution trace of our LP model featuring two agents A and B and two token types tau0 and tau1. We note that this model obviously generalizes over n users and m different token types uh, without problems. Now that we have shown uh, an introduction to the formalization of lending pools in our model, we note that these formal semantics allows us to formally prove certain properties. So for example, the exchange rate of minted tokens must increase. This is important because this incentivizes users to deposit to the lending pool, which enables, the, well, which enables the subsequent borrowing. Furthermore, there are certain preservation properties that we can formally prove, such as that the supply of free tokens must be maintained. This is important to ensure that funds are never um, are correctly accounted for in the implementation. Still, lending pool security is hard to reason about. There are conflicting economic goals, namely the goal of maximizing interest versus the goal of maximizing the funds available for future borrowing and redeeming. Loans can sometimes become un unrecoverable if prices um, uh, fluctuate too much. And furthermore, it is sometimes difficult to reason about tax and the effectiveness of incentives. Still, we believe the formalization of the transition semantics that we have in our model allow us to further explore these questions with additional assumptions. We now provide an introduction to the swap semantics in our model. AMMs are disintermediated market makers in DeFi. In our example here, we have two agents as before, agent A and agent B, who are mutually unknown and untrusted. A holds 70 units of tau zero and 70 units of tau one, and would like to increase his value of holdings of these two token types. B, on their hand, would like to swap between tau zero and tau one. 
In order for B to be able to swap, A first must deposit funds of both token types, which it does from gamma 0 to gamma 1. We see that a new AMM pair has been created, and that A receives uh, 70 units of minted token types, minted tokens, re representing the pair tau 0, tau 1. This allows Agent A to later redeem these minted tokens in return for its share of the underlying assets of the two token types held by the pair. Following this deposit, B can now perform a swap action. B wishes to swap 30 units of tau 0 for at least 20 units of tau 1. We can see in gamma 1 that the effective exchange rate is 21 units of tau 1, which B reserves Returns in, um, returns, uh, receives in return for, for the swap. The effective swap rate between tau 0 and tau 1 is determined by the funds invariant I, which is specific to the implementation of the AMM. We show different funds invariants on the graph on the left-hand side. Here, the dots re represent the ratio of uh, units of tau 0 over the units of tau 1 in the AMM pair. In the current state, we show the funds ratio of the AMM pair in the purple dot, where we have 70 units of both token types. If we use the um, funds invariant graphed in black, then the swap will result in uh, funds of 100 units of tau 0 and 49 units of tau 1, as shown in the dark purple dot. But we can also see that if we use a different funds invariant, the swap rate will be different. The funds invariant must be constant uh, during a swap. If R0 represents the units of tau0 and R1 represents the units of tau1, then I of R0 and R1 must equal I of R0 prime and R1 prime, R0 prime and R1 prime being the units of tau0 and tau1 after the swap. In order to generalize behavior of AMMs across different funds invariants, we have defined uh, uh, properties which we denote incentive consistency of a funds invariant I. The three properties, swap rate continuity, non-depletion, and exchange rate consistency. We refer to our paper for more details of these definitions. These higher level definitions of incentive consistency allow us to prove certain properties and behavior of AMMs. For example, we formalize that there exists a unique arbitrage game solution for an AMM instantiated with an incentive consistent funds invariant I. We can formalize the arbitrage game as follows. Given an AMM pair, shown here on the left hand side, and a global exchange rate, the arbitrage game is played with a single user who seeks to maximize its net wealth by either performing a swap or doing nothing at all. For any incentive consistent funds invariant I, there must exist a unique arbitrage solution, consisting of either a swap action or no action at all, and at any global price. We can visualize this as follows. Here, the arbitrage solution is a swap that results in a resulting state which uh, trails that of the global exchange rate. This is important because this, show, this proves to us that any AMM that is instantiated with an incentive consistent funds invariant will trail the global exchange rate and represent an accurate price. Our semantics of AMM actions allows us to prove foundational properties such as preservation, namely that of token supplies, and net wealth for certain transactions such as deposit and redeem. We also are able to contribute a concurrency theory of AMM transactions over the, the actions deposit, redeem, swap, and transfer. We define incentive consistent funds invariants and provide properties which they must uh, fulfill. This allows us to prove that a unique arbitrage game solution exists, and for such AMMs we can then show that the price must, be, must, must accurately trail that of the global exchange rate. We can also show with uh, uh, incentive consistent funds and variance that the swap rate is improved upon deposits, thereby incentivizing future swaps. Furthermore, we also show, show that the redeem rate of a given pair, tau0, tau1, must increase at a given funds ratio, furthermore incentivizing deposits.
In conclusion, we propose formal models which facilitate the analysis of DeFi and allows us to prove foundational properties thereof. We abstract economic models specific to implementations and that allows us to generalize and formalize their key properties. In future work, we plan to analyze foundational security of DeFi composition, allowing us to provide higher abstractions of DeFi functionality and behavior, leading towards a formal theory of DeFi. We thank you very much for your attention.